Eddie? 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 He's ignoring me. I don't know why he bothers. I wind up talking to myself half the time anyway. <laughs> Can you smell something? I smell something. The kids are always telling me my house smells. That happens when you get old. Your kids come over and tell you to throw your food out and your house smells. <laughs> I don't care. I've done enough cleaning in my day. It's not like I don't have other things to do. <laughs> oh, they're packing. Eddie says I should just stuff it all in bags and let the kids sort through it. Not a chance any of them would have time for that. Oh, here's Eddie and me on our honeymoon. We went to the Laurentians, took the train. We were such kids. He was a handsome devil, still is. We were married right out of school. I told him I'd take him on a trial basis only. <laughs> now he tells me I'm 50 years beyond my warranty. <laughs> no refunds. <laughs> Wouldn't want one. Not to say we didn't have our moments, mind you. He's a stubborn thing, not to mention rude. Of course, the kids could never imagine their father and me apart. Of course, they can't imagine their father and me having sex either. <laughs> so I guess it evens out. <coughs> this is our Margaret's wedding. Her boys asked me to get them pictures of them with their father. He's long since gone. Never liked him. Just for fun, I'd make sure he got the butt of the roast at Sunday dinner. <laughs> Always had an answer for everything, that one. I knew it wasn't going to work. Never told Margaret that, of course. Nothing to be gained by it. Now, who in the world is that? April 1953, Niagara Falls, Viola. My sister, Viola. Truth be told, Margaret was never cut out for marriage. Oh, sure, when they went their separate ways, all the kids rallied around and made him out to be the villain. He was no choir boy, but she certainly wasn't ready for marriage. She spent more time taking care of Tom than she did her husband. Marriage is work. No way around it. I told my girls there were days, but for the grace of God, I'd have killed their father. <laughs> Once I found out how gassy Eddie could get, it was only for the sacrament of marriage that I didn't pack his bags. <laughs> Of course, the girls still think the sun, the moon, and the stars shine at their father's back passage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. See him each, you'd think he was born in a barn. There's that smell again. It's that damn pipe of his, I'm sure that's what it is. He's been smoking it since his mother weaned him. <laughs> There's my father at one of the kids' birthday parties. He was a mean old bugger. <laughs> Our Jeremy looks just like him. The similarities end there, thank heavens. Isn't that terrible? If I ever heard mine talking about their father like that, they'd live to regret it. Here's one of me and my brothers and sisters. Look at the rags we were in. Poor as church mice. Now, what was I? Where was I? Oh, good gravy, I've got work to do. I've got to get this place set up before Eddie gets up from his nap. Eight kids. You'd think one of them could come and paint their parents' living room. Seven, really. I don't imagine Tom would do as much good. Shouldn't complain. They're good kids. I tease them about not having time for their doddering old mother. They tell me I don't understand because I never worked. Well, if eight screaming kids isn't work, I don't know what is. 
We never went in for all this other jazz, fancy cars, clothes, and fun. Eddie and I never had anything to speak of. Oh, we could have lived a little better than we did, I suppose. We just weren't spenders, that's all. Eddie used to say, a car will get you from A to B, doesn't matter what you're driving. As for clothes, he wore the same suit for the first six years we were married, and I bought him a new one on his birthday. I still tell him I want to see him in his birthday suit. <laughs> <laughs> he never took a vacation. He was too busy coaching hockey or baseball. Eddie told our kids from the time they were this high, you're lucky to have food on the table, clothes on your back, and a roof over your head. Consider yourself lucky if you keep all three the rest of your life. Kids today all think the world's going to end if they're not driving an MBW or taking a vacation in the Caribbean. It's all fun and games. It won't be fun and games if we don't get this place painted. Daddy thinks if he leaves it long enough, I'll do it. <laughs> not bloody likely. <laughs> not today. I made him his toast and eggs this morning, just the way he likes them. Miserable creep didn't come down. <laughs> We're still sitting on the kitchen table. I don't care. I'm going out. Hate them cold for all I care. He's mad at me. He must be. That's the way it is. Not much in the way of fancy things here. Nope. Just kids. Eight of them. Almost. <coughs> we miss our Janie. Maybe one of them will come today. I love to have the boys drop in. Nothing wrong with that. It's not like I'm one of those apron string mothers. Eddie's sister Myrna is like that. Sends me around the bend. Her kids are at her house morning, noon, and night. I just want to tell them. Get off the tit. You're a grown <laughs> man. <laughs> <coughs> is 43 years old, and I swear he wouldn't go to the bathroom without checking with his mother. <laughs> Parents these days, I don't know how the kids stand them. Always on top of them about everything. As soon as mine could walk, I'd put them out the door and tell them to go and play. Well, I bet you wouldn't put your kids out the door and tell them to go and play in this day and age. <laughs> of course, to hear my kids tell it. Eddie and I were as negligent as they come. <laughs> I'm supposed to play bridge this afternoon. Friday's my bridge day. What time is it? Oh, phooey. 4.30? That can't be right. That can't be. I just ate lunch. I did. I'm sure I did. Doesn't make any sense. Cheapy. Can tell what time it is anymore. This thing is always on the fritz. <laughs> Junk. I've got to do my arthritis exercises before I go. I laugh at the way our kids are with their own, holding their hands on the slide, playing ball with them, lying down with them at night. The poor kids can hardly breathe without their parents wiping their noses or taking their temperature. Give the kids some peace and leave them alone, I say. I used to tell my, don't call me unless one of you is dead or bleeding. <laughs> and if you're bleeding, stay off my broad loom. <laughs> I sure as heck wasn't running around taking their temperature every five minutes. Paid off in the end. Mine are a tough bunch. Resilient too. Because they all think they were born that way. Listen to me. Wouldn't Janie love to hear me patting myself on the back? It's a different world raising kids these days. I think the kids don't get enough discipline. When I was raising mine, they got told once. They knew if I had to tell them again, it was going to be with a wooden spoon across their backside. But back then, we had the energy to do that. <laughs> right out of school and started having babies. None of those girls worked. People were forever asking me if I minded being at home with all those kids, especially with Tom. I never understood that. 
I don't imagine I would have had children if I minded being around them. They're a real blessing, you know. Things were harder for us after everything with Janie. The boys were forever on me about something, being late for their hockey practice or wanting to live to so-and-so's house. I'd be annoyed and want to tell them. But I'd catch myself. I'd remember and I'd just put it aside. Kids will teach you a thing or two. Some lessons are learned harder than others. Tom was an education all on his own. He's our special angel. Eddie called him an angel in disguise once, and I thought that was perfect for him. What a time we had with him. When he was born, the doctor told me he wouldn't make it to the end of the day. Eddie and I had never even heard of cerebral palsy. Imagine what was going through our minds when the doctor started telling us about it. He'd never walk, talk, feed himself, on and on and on. It was just so silly the way they were talking. You'd have thought I'd given birth to the devil himself. The one doctor there insisted that there was no way we could possibly care for this child. He must have said it a dozen times if he said it once. Leave the baby here. Well, there was no bloody way I was leaving any kid of mine in that place. Why? So they could put a do not feed, do not resuscitate order in his crib? Not likely. Then he took one look at me and he knew. I told the doctor to go stick it. <laughs> Here they were talking about a newborn, telling us he'd be a burden on us the rest of our lives. He'd never learn. He'd be a cripple mental defective and all the rest of it. And I kept thinking to myself, this child isn't an hour out of the womb, and you know everything there is to know about him. <coughs> I just didn't buy it. Besides, if you go in with those expectations, that's likely what you'd get. We took him home the next day, never looked back. Not to say it was easy, far from it. Wrestling with feeding tubes, <coughs> catheters, wheelchairs, you name it. Poor Tom hasn't got a mean bone in that broken little body. Heart as big as a whale. Honestly, you've never seen forgiveness like his. I remember sitting here in the living room once. In walks Michael, Kevin, and Jeremy. Toques, scarves, boots, hockey sticks, all piling through the door. Runny noses, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. Where's Tom? Where do you think he is? In his room studying, of course. You'd have thought the Eighth Army had arrived. The three of them go pounding up the stairs. Down they come a minute later, carrying Tom in his chair. Out the door they go. Of course, I'm wondering what the hanging are up to. Eddie walks in 20 minutes later. Have you seen your sons, he says. And did you not see them on your way in, I asked. Well, I saw them all right. You may want to have a look yourself, sissy. Over to the window I go. The four of them are out there playing road hockey. They're using poor Tom as a goal post. <laughs> <laughs> Too dumb to open a closet and take a pair of boots like all the other kids in the neighborhood. <laughs> the three of them spent the next two weeks painting the girls' bedrooms. I would have had them do the living room too. Tom felt so bad for them. He went and told his father he didn't mind being a goal post just as long as they didn't take slap shots. <laughs> <laughs> that was good enough for Eddie. <coughs> anyway, our crippled mental defective has a master's degree in chemical engineering and lectures at the university. I'm not the weepy type, but I'll tell you, the day I watched him wheel up that aisle to get his degree, and you're bit through my lip trying to hold back the tears. It wasn't just for Tom. All the years of work and worry and the money. It was our victory. Me and Eddie. So much for doctors.
You know, any agent will tell you the hardest houses to sell are smokers. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie said to me the other day, all right, Miss High and Mighty, you're forever on about letting go of things. We've lived in this pile for a hundred years. There's no kids here to enjoy it. I say we get rid of it. I picked up the phone on the spot and called Doris. She's coming on Monday to list it for sale. I told Eddie, come hell or high water, she's not coming in here before we get a coat of paint on these walls. Just as well I'm going out. Can't stand the smell. He's putting it off. That's what he's doing. <laughs> this will send a couple of them off the deep end. The kids love these. They're going to Jeremy. Jer loves them more than anybody. But his mother gave them to us for a wedding. She got them from an aunt of hers. I don't know what our kids are thinking. They come around, all of a sudden they're complimenting this or that. <laughs> so we don't know what they're up to. <laughs> Three of them have told me in the last year what beautiful paintings they are. They've been on the walls for 53 years. <laughs> and now they notice them. <laughs> I was teasing our Danny last week. I told him he was out of the room. He laughed. Said he didn't need a toaster oven anyway. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you do with your things. <coughs> Someone's going to feel gypped. I think the bunch of them have enough sense not to fight over the pittance they'll get from Eddie and me. Anyway, if they do fight over things, then at least they're speaking. <laughs> the kids are good that way. Except Junie, of course. They're lost girl. Well, not lost, just different. She's pleasant to the other kids when she sees them, but she doesn't go out of her way. Janie got in with a group I wasn't fond of. She was such a shy kid. Eddie and I worried about her. She never seemed to be able to keep friends. It was hard for her. Our other girls had good pals. Kids they'd bring home from school and play dolls with or do up their hair with. That never happened with Janie. But Eddie and I talked about it. We agreed. She didn't seem lonely and never complained about not having friends, so we didn't fuss over it. <coughs> that was wrong. You should have fussed about it. You should have talked to her about it. We didn't. At first, when she got in with the group, we were happy for her. She'd come home and talk and talk and talk about them. They were all so fun and so nice and so on. Eddie and I never heard her talk so much. But not just about her new friends. She'd talk about everything and anything. Her whole world seemed to be opening up. It all seemed a bit naive or innocent, I guess. When I say innocent, I mean she was a bit behind other kids her age. Our older ones were so different at that age. She was 18 when she met up with the group. When the older ones were that age, they were experimenting with pot and drinking on the weekends. Normal kids stuff. <laughs> Not Janie. She never got anywhere near that kind of thing. I think that's why Eddie and I weren't concerned at first. We did find it a bit strange that she never wanted to bring these people home. She'd have known they'd be welcome any time. All our kids' friends came here. That's just the way it was. I think the first signal we got was that she didn't want any of the kids to meet her group. Michael and Deborah told her they wanted to come to one of their get-togethers. Peace out, she called them. Janie said no. She didn't think that would be a good idea. We were concerned, but at that point she'd never even mentioned anything about God or human prophet or any other nonsense. That came later. Not all at once either. It started one day with me. 
We're at the kitchen table, just her and me. She started asking questions, strange questions. Did I realize that Eddie and I couldn't be saved without a prophet? And would we understand if she wanted to give herself over to the prophet? There was no talking to her. I told her the whole thing was the worst kind of foolishness. She didn't get it. The next year or so was very bad. It was like Nothing I ever imagined could happen to us. It's like someone taking my child from me, one tiny piece at a time, slowly, bit by bit, and there was nothing we could do to stop it. It was chaos. Every day she'd come in and rage against Eddie and me. We tried everything. We argued with her listened to her. We ignored her. We reasoned with her. Everything we did was wrong. No matter what we said, she'd say, they told us she'd say that. There were rumors around about what the leader got the girls to do for him. At first I couldn't begin to think what that might have meant. Then I saw I made Eddie take me to their compound, as they called it. <coughs> he pulled up to a fence, and there he was, standing with a bunch of young girls, all of them pretty, like our Janie. He was wearing a shirt that showed his arms, strong, dark, hairy arms, thick muscles. It was in the summer, and he was wearing a pair of shorts, jeans cut off. Privates bulged through. All the girls stood there giggling when he talked. They stood in a circle around him. He walked around the circle with a Bible in his hand and told them to feel his divinity through a sacred kiss. He kissed each of them on the lips. They watched him through the fence. And he saw us watching him strangest thing. He smiled at us and just laughed for a second. I thought of something in that moment. There was a tar iron in the trunk. I wanted to get it and smash him on the head with it. I wanted to see his brain splattered on the dirt ground. And I wanted to smash those bulging parts in his pants. He was laughing at us. He had told them that he was the prophet and that they could never go back to us. We were impure because we needed to be loved by them. He told them that the only one they really needed to love was God. And by loving his prophet alone, they'd be loving God. Janie saw us watching. She was embarrassed when she turned on us. She had to prove herself to them. She came in that night from her meeting. I was sitting waiting. I don't remember what I was planning to say. I didn't get two words out before she accused me and Eddie of every kind of evil imaginable. I was so beside myself with worry and exhaustion. I screamed at her. Floozy disgrace. I told her she wasn't welcome to stay anymore. But as long as she was with that group, we didn't want her in the house. She'd gotten what she wanted. Eddie was on the stairs behind me. He went and got some things for her. She took them from him on the front porch. I didn't see her again for 12 years. I must have 
wished a million times to hear her rage against me during those years. I never spoke to Eddie about it. I was afraid he'd tell me what I already knew. It was me who made her go away. She's not with the group anymore. Hasn't been for a long time. She still doesn't speak to Eddie or me. I've tried. Sent cards, left messages. We see her now and again at one of the kids' houses. She's polite. The thing is, she's safe and not in any danger. Deborah talks to her more than anyone else. She's awfully patient with her. Oh, I've got my bridge game. <coughs> this is my bridge day, isn't it? Of course it is. I'm knitting Eddie a new sweater for his birthday. Picked up the wool the other day at the Koreans. <coughs> Variety on the corner. I was looking for some plastic sheeting. And as near as I could tell, the man was saying they didn't have any. You know the kind I mean. Like you'd use to cover furniture. That kind. They may have had it, who knows. I never understood a word they're saying in there. My friend Mary B does. She says they're lovely people, the Koreans. Of course she'd know. She's been to Europe. <laughs> when I asked Mary B why they didn't have a <coughs> for furniture, she said I was nuttier than a fruitcake. She said I needed to go to the home hardware, not a variety store. I told her I was there for Eddie's pipe tobacco, so I thought I'd ask. Aren't I awful? I really shouldn't buy it for him. I keep telling him if the tobacco doesn't kill him, he'll go up in flames. He will too. He falls asleep, you know. <coughs> He's got that GD thing lit, and he'll just drop off to sleep in his chair, burning pipe tobacco, dropping all down his front. <laughs> Honest to Pete. One of these times he'll burn his privates. That'll teach him. <laughs> He'll be down here the minute he runs out of tobacco. I'd ask him to pick up my plastic, but I don't want him driving, really. He nearly drove over a mourner in the parking lot of the funeral parlour the other day. Love her, Eddie. She was a square old thing. But we knocked her down all right, but she didn't go under the wheels. <laughs> we held our breath for a moment. Then she just popped right back on. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never guess, wasn't it, Mona Kelly? <laughs> we roared with laughter. <laughs> she was on her way in to see Jack Dempsey. Jack died. They were from the old parish. We kept in touch every now and then. I mostly kept up with them through Mona. I was so surprised when I read in the paper that Jack had died. He was always so active. <laughs> I don't know why I was surprised. I was reading the old bits. Mm. I do that, you know. <laughs> I should get new reading glasses, but oh, they're expensive. These optometrists charge an arm and a leg. I went to school with an optometrist, Tubby Callahan. His real name was Trevor, but we called him Tubby. He married a lovely girl, Marlis, or Martha, I think her name was. I used to play bridge with her. That was a hundred years ago. She made the most out of this world brownies. I'll have to make sure it's not that loud, crinkly kind of plastic. Mm -hmm. I need quiet plastic. <clears throat> quiet is best. It was so sad to lay Jack to rest. Poor Mrs. Dempsey. Jack was doing so well. He'd been sick a year or two before. I think it was his gallbladder or cancer. One of those things. Then he got better. And off they went down south. I'd love to have a place somewhere warm. Eddie always says we have a place somewhere warm. The furnace room. <laughs> <laughs> it's so dumb, but I laugh every time he says it. <laughs> anyway, they weren't back from their trip two days and Jack was sick again. Not sick, 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 but just enough that he'd go to the doctor. Apparently they checked him in a week later. She said he died that night. And they just had new carpet put down. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> 
they had was a disaster. An awful little dog of theirs was forever piddling on it. <laughs> I'm looking for a piece of plastic, say, seven feet by five feet. Just big enough for our bed. Don't get any ideas. There's nothing like that. <laughs> Not to say we don't have relations, you'd be surprised. Eddie still comes for a visit every now and again. That's what we call it, having a visit. <laughs> Here I am telling all our secrets. I just want some plastic to cover the mattress under our sheets. My friend Wilma G told me when her Phil died, we were at home in bed. According to Wilma, when he stopped breathing, he let go of all his bodily fluids. <laughs> and he's 75 and you just never know. We've only had that box spring and mattress since the summer. I just <laughs> don't want it. <laughs> I don't care so much about the sheets. Besides, but he's not well. I'll just put on the old ratty ones from the attic. I can always run them through the wash if anything happens. Wilma said it cost her a fortune to have her surge cleaned, and it still smells like feces. <laughs> oh, heavens, I've got to get going. Eddie and I get a little apartment somewhere. It's just as well. I can't keep this place like I used to. Doris is coming on Monday to list the house. I think it's Monday. Isn't that awful? this. This can't be. Today is Friday, right? Today's my bridge day. It is Friday. No. This isn't right. It was Friday today. Today was Morning. It was Friday. What time is it? Eddie went for a snuff this morning. I was sure of it. It was this morning. Eddie? Eddie? I'll paint the room myself, I suppose. <coughs> this all seemed a million miles away. And now it's here. Right in front of me. It's an awful thing, really. Sometimes the road just takes a turn and you don't quite know where you're headed. I'll be all right. I will, won't I, Eddie? You remember when we were just married? After I lost our first, I was so frightened. You 
lay together. You put your hand here and said we would be blessed. And I wasn't afraid anymore. You were always so brave. You kept the fear away. I'll try and be brave for you, Eddie. Like we talked about. It all went so fast. Yesterday I walked down the aisle. I was beautiful. Wasn't I, Eddie? And you, you were my sun, shining on me, warming me. I gave you myself. I gave you our baby. You fed me and protected me. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you for my blue dress. I know it was hard for you to talk to the sales lady. Thank you for making Danny go back to school. Thank you for telling Tom he could do it. Thank you for not telling Margaret that you didn't like him. Thank you for making Kevin pay for his own skates. Thank you for letting me cry about Jane. Thank you for everything. I'm sorry about the shingles, you were right. Sorry about Deborah's graduation party and the mortgage money. And all the times I was too tired. I can feel you now, Eddie. Here with me. Inside my heart. I made a vow to you, Eddie made vows to each other. Thank you for your vow. I want you to know I'd still take you, Eddie. To have and to hold. To comfort and protect. For richer in sickness and in health. Until death, do I? 